Hello and welcome to the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. We are coming closer and closer to the end of the liturgical year. Last week we started on this uh, meditation on the of the eschatological times. This is what we do usually in the month of November. We remember those who have gone before us. We remember that uh, their lives were not, did not end in death, but that their lives were changed. This is a great imperative in the church to think about that always, to think about uh, those who have gone before us, uh, our saints, that you know they are not with us because they have answered the call of God. Um, I started last week with this beautiful song that I learned when I was young. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's the refrain that will carry us through uh, the month of November. This world is not home. So we continue this week to meditate on the end times, not to plunge us into a depression, but to give us hope. So the question this week is, last week we meditated on our lives as we know them, this week we meditate on something else. This world, as you know it, will end. Or, put it in a very personal way, my world, as I know it today, will end. Now, when we start talking about eschatological times or end times, it sometimes feels like uh, those gloom homilies. But let us go to the scriptures and see what, why we are meditating on this. Jesus finds himself in the temple area today and he sees the people admiring the stones on the temple area. And then he says this very provocative statement. He says, this stuff that you're looking at and marveling at, a time will come, not one stone will be left standing on another. And that just causes a, uh, uh, a backlash. When we read in the scriptures, they ask him, so when will this happen, right? It, it seems like an innocent question. It is like they're laughing at him. They're saying, you are kidding. There is absolutely no way the temple can be destroyed. The temple uh, in Jesus' time was the most impressive building in all of ancient Near East. We are talking about the most guarded place. Uh, actually, uh, when we look into the, Mark, uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, uh, we know uh, that exactly when this event happened. So most the, uh, uh, most people who study theology um, have this agreement that Jesus was crucified on April the 7th, 30 AD. This event that we are talking about today happens on April the 4th, 30 AD. Uh, so what is happening or what, what does the temple represent uh, on April 4th, 30 AD? It represents permanence. It represents God's presence. This is a massive building. There is the, the court of the women, then there's a wall, there's the, no, the court of the Gentiles, then there's a wall, the court of the women, then there's a wall, the court of the men, then there's a wall, and then there's a holy of holies. They have never, nothing compares in the ancient Near East. And Jesus says to this, not a stone will be left. Now, here's how I reflect on the end of the world. I ask actually a question to you. How many times has the world, as you know it, come to an end? I remember the first time the world, as I knew it, came to an end. I was about 16, 17 years old, still at Mukasa Minor Seminary in Choma, Zambia. Uh, the headmaster, Father McKenna, called me to the office. He takes off his glasses, looks me in the eye and says, your father is dead, go home. Wow, wow, just like that. Not building it up and saying, hey, maybe you need to go home, your dad is sick. No, it was, your father is dead, you need to go home. And I remember in that moment what dad represented. He represented security. 
he represented home, safety. He represented uh, uh, providence. <coughs> Everything that I knew, my world was secure. I was invisible because my dad was such a big presence. I never thought he would ever die. And then, just like that, he's gone. I remember getting on the train and going back home. And as I was approaching home, I could hear the sound of wailing and crying and mourning. Yes, indeed. And then it began to sink in that this person who was the one that kept everything together, this person who seemed to be so big that death could not even touch him, my whole world came crumbling down. With the death of my father, the world as I knew it ended. We were immediately plunged into the poorest of the poor. Mama had seven children. How will she educate all of them? Uh, interesting enough, uh, mom is back in Zambia uh, and she is visiting Zambia because now she lives in the United States. She has been in the United States four times. If you asked her, when she was mourning her husband, as she was going through that difficult time, did she see how things were going to pan out? Whenever there is a death, a world ending, for us, there is also a new beginning. Second story. Uh, for seven years, I was a passionist. All I knew was wearing the passionist habit. My very identity was a rooted in being a passionist. Then one day, Father Martin Coffey calls me and he tells me, nah, we're done here. I remember being outside in Mulepalole, Botswana, with my suitcase thinking, what am I going to do now at 27 years old? Do I go back home and tell mama, oh, things did not work out? Everything that I knew was being a passionist. And then, just like that, it ends. The world as I, I remember going into, uh, when I was uh, boarding the plane to come to the United States, somebody says, uh, have a good day, sir. <laughs> Nobody had ever called me sir. They always called me brother, brother Robert. And everything came tumbling down. Little did I know that in a few years later, I would land in Lebanon, Kentucky, where I'm very loved. I'll be in Louisville, Kentucky, with a wonderful faith community. When we go through a death, when the world as we know it comes to an end, we are called to look closer. When my father died, we came to know who Jehovah Jireh is, the God that provides. We came to know Jehovah Sabbath. We came to know Jehovah El Shaddai, the one almighty God who provides, not because things fell from the heavens. No, the people in our village, the people in our town stepped up and they became the very presence of God. There was a new rebirth, a new knowing of God. Now, Jesus prophesies that the temple will, end, will, will, will not stand. This is in April the 4th, 30 AD. In the year 66 AD, the Jewish people start a revolution. By the year 70, the temple is destroyed. By the year 90, St. Luke is writing this gospel passage. What has happened all these years? James, the brother of the Lord, has been massacred. The church is going through a very difficult time. And James and, uh, and, and uh, Luke is writing to the Christian community saying to them, hold on to faith. The world as you know it, yes, comes to an end. But if you just hold on, something beautiful begins to spring up. And that is what we bring during this month of November. Something beautiful begins to spring up. So for those who are going through a rough time, who have lost everything, who can't see, look, see into the future, all they see now is the pain. Remember when St. Luke is writing this, they are not out of the woods yet. The church invites us to look at moments of death as moments of rebirth. Make sure, though, throughout this, make sure you place your faith in things that matter. Remember what Jesus says, 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass. What is that word? That word for me is this. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the ages. So, yes, the world as you and I know it will come to an end. But what a beautiful beginning it will also uh, experience. God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.